Napoleonic battle staffs. Uh, we've discussed operational warfare in the past as well as strategic and tactical levels and we've also discussed units and unit sizes and what they all mean. Well, operational warfighting, we're going to take that just a little farther and we're going to look at Napoleonic um, formations of the battle staff. And it isn't to say that battle staffs didn't exist prior to Napoleon, it's just that he codified it so very well. Before I even get really deep into this, I should say I'm not going to get that deep into this. I'm going to keep it at a pretty much a surface level. And part of the reason is this changes. It changes from one military to a different foreign military. They implement it in slightly different ways, sometimes, you know, starkly different, but usually it's just nuanced differences. Um, and inside the United States Armed Forces, one branch of service, the Navy from the Air Force, are going to implement this difference as well. Um, and then finally, even inside the same unit, one command team can come in and have, while all the shops and the different uh, staff shops will stay nominally the same, they may have different effects cells. We spell that FX, but it's the effect. So the effect cells and different working groups and the dynamics and nuance of how each one interacts can change pretty significantly from one command team to the other. But for all the differences, there's a great deal of continuity. That is, there are uh, regular trends that you see. Again, this goes back to uh, Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon himself for the battle staff. So, um, What's a battle staff? Well, for me, this is really telling. You've heard me make reference to this when we were talking about sizes and commands and who does what. I will say that tactical units, this is my assertion, bear with me, tactical units do not have battle staffs. They have command teams. And for me, what separates tactical from operational units and tactical from operational warfare, one of the critical dividing lines, if you will, will be that uh, tactical units have command teams, whereas operational units have command teams and battle staffs. Okay, we're going to get into what I mean by a battle staff, but here's what I mean by that. A fire team leader, you know, fire team or a crew has one command, one leader. A squad leader or squad commander has, you know, maybe a squad and a deputy squad. Um, and then you're up the platoon, you know. We went from four people to ten people to thirty to forty man platoon. A platoon will typically have a command team of roughly three people, where a company, a hundred to hundred and fifty people in a company, depending on the type of company, right? A company will have a command team of something like six individuals that play key critical roles. Of course, just a single commander, but maybe six. Now, you get from a company, and for me, that's where small unit tactics, and it's, I say tactical units, what I really mean here is small unit tactics, our company and below. This is not doctrine. This is just my observation of how we actually practice warfighting. And company below are your maneuver units that are doing tactical work. And again, they have command teams, but not battle staffs. From the battalion on up, battalion, you know, regiment, America doesn't use regiments so much anymore. We use brigades, which are larger, divisions, corps, and then army, um, or army groups, all of these things, even joint task force. They have battle staffs. Now, Let's talk about size. A battalion might have a battle staff of, say, two dozen people. Because a battalion is six to eight hundred people, or five to eight hundred people, and it's going to have roughly two dozen people on the battle staff. That's the command team and the battle staff. Whereas a brigade will have two to three hundred, depending on whether it's a separate brigade operating on its own, roughly five thousand troops, or a, you know, a maneuver brigade of a division, roughly 3,500 troops, but it'll have a battle staff and command team of something in the nature of two to 300 people, where a division of 10 to 12,000 troops, a division can be 900 people on that battle staff and command team. I mean, it's just ginormous, and it gets bigger and bigger as you get larger. And so that's what I'm saying. Well, when you get uh, two dozen people working for you, let alone 900, 
they need to separate into their areas of specialty. And that's what we mean by a battle staff. So you'll often hear S1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to S7, right? And uh, G1, G2, G3, 4, 5, 6 to, you know, whatever, 8 or 9. And then J, and J1, J2, J3. Well, what does the S, the G, and the J mean? Fair enough, and it's simple. S literally means staff. And this is a staff of a field grade officer that is typically a lieutenant colonel, a major, a lieutenant colonel, a colonel. And that is really battalion or regiment. That's what that means. It's a battalion or regiment. Now a G, a G staff stands for general, a general officer. Um, and that's at your brigade, your division, your corps, your army. And finally, you'll have a J staff. And a J staff is a joint staff that is typically either of a joint task force or all the way up at the Pentagon, right, where it's joint because all the branches are coming together. So your S staff, your G staff, your J staff, for the sake of this video we're going to just stick to one but again each one of them has different formations and it's not uncommon to see uh you know a j and a g staff going a g8 g9 a j11 what are those it's convoluted and frankly they're not real consistent we go back to the battalion or excuse me the napoleonic idea of a staff the s staff and that's at uh, again battalion or regiment and it stays far more consistent let's discuss s staff and uh, again, recognizing that they do vary from one type of unit to another and from one military to another. Even though there is a staff, and we're going to look at like, you know, the S staff at battalion or regiment, there is still a command team, right? And the command team is made up of the commanding officer, the executive officer, the command sergeant major, the fire support officer, and the chief of staff. And again, commanding officer does exactly what you think. Culture, uh, commander's intent, the vision, um, they're the commander. The executive officer handles all sorts of administrative tasks um, and is ready to step up to be the CO if necessary. Sometimes you'll hear instead of an executive officer, you'll hear a deputy commander. And that is someone who, again, is ready to jump into that commanding officer's role. So you can actually have a commanding officer, a deputy commander, an executive officer. It just doesn't happen typically at uh, battalion and regiment, but it's possible. And certainly at higher staffs, you will see that. Then you have the command sergeant major, who is responsible, again, for culture and discipline and standards uh, throughout the unit. And the fire support officer, who handles any attached artillery, uh, of course, their own mortar platoons or, um, you know, companies, and close air support. And the FSO, the fire support officer, works with all sorts of attached Ford observers and combat controllers and anything else that comes to them, but they all answer under the fire support officer, uh, who again brings even just the battalion mortar platoon that is directly held there by the FSO at the discretion of the commanding officer. And then you have your chief of staff. What's the chief of staff? Well, the chief of staff is who synchronizes and coordinates and racks and stacks all of the S battle staff. So we're going to go through an S1 through S7. I'm going to rattle them off, then I'll back up and tell you what each one is. So you have your S1 shop, that's personnel. Your S2 shop, that's intelligence. Your S3 shop, that's operations. Your S4 shop, logistics. Your S5 shop, which is your civil affairs. Your S6 shop, which is your communications. And your S7 shop, which is training. So the command team leads all of this. Chief of staff oversees the day-to-day -day task and the synchronization coordination of the shops the S shops. The S1 shop personnel is led by the personnel officer or in, and or NCO. Um, the principal product of the S1 shop is the time phase force deployment data, which is the tip fit. Basically, it's saying, where are all my troops and when do they get to whatever we're deploying to? Right, that's your tip fit, the time phased force deployment data. And they're tracking all of that. And if that sounds like a small thing, trust me, it ain't. That's a really complex sheet um, and matrix and everything else. And of course, underneath the S1 shop, you'll see a, um, finance representatives, make sure everybody's getting paid and that budget reporting and constraints are adhered to. Um, you'll see, typically, you'll see the first aid section and the chaplain services nested under personnel. Yes, one personnel shop. That makes sense. So your first aid section and your chaplain services. The S2 shop is your intelligence shop. Uh, unsurprisingly, it is led by the intelligence officer and NCO. Um, they have 
two primary products that they their output products um, and uh, and one critical task that is always true to them. So the products are the intelligence preparation of the battle space, that's the IPB, it's your map overlays and all of this other stuff. Um, and of course they're going to help develop things like the CCIR, Commander's Critical Information Requirements, but they do this through the threat assessment. So that's the other critical product that they have is threat assessment. The S2 shop has also a critical tasker and that is in the military decision making process, the MDMP, the S2 intelligence shop always functions in one of the FX cells as the op for. So when they war game different courses of action in the MDMP, the S2 always plays the bad guys. Next we come to the S3 shop. Um, S3 operations, one of the things that we say about the S3 is, uh, or rather the battle staffs, is that all battle staff officers are equal but the S3 ops officer is the most equal. And what we mean by that is you can have a wonderful plan, but the, the gatekeeper to building onto the plan, the operation plan, which later becomes the operations order, the gatekeeper to that is the S3 operations officer. And so any other person, but let's talk about S shops, if any of the other shops have a great idea or a critical um, you know, mass, uh, you know, some kind of cautionary warning that they want to get into that operational plan and into the planning cycle and into the FX cells and anything like that, they can get literally the commander to say yes, but if the S3 ops officer doesn't know about it, it doesn't get into the plan it doesn't get into the plan. The S3 ops officer is the circus leader, right? He's the guy with the tall hat and the chair and the whip and going, yay, and introducing and yelling at everybody. So if he doesn't know or she doesn't know, it's not known. And this makes the S3 ops officer the most equal of all of the S shops. The ops officer and NCO produce uh, the sync matrix. So the sync matrix is this large, colorful horse blanket that says where everything and everyone will be at any time in the universe. And again, if you didn't tell the ops officer, it's not in the plan and therefore won't be in the order. The S3 also has a critical tasker. And in the MDMP, the military decision-making process, they are in an FX cell, the course of action development, and they always play the blue four commander. So the S2 Intel officer plays the op four in any war gaming, and the S3 officer plays the blue four in any war gaming. So that's a critical tasker for them. The next is your S4 shop logistics. Yes, it is headed up by a logistics officer and or NCO. Their product, again, it would be the logistics plan, and that is as exhaustive as you think it is. And yeah, huge budgetaries, what's in supply, what's, what do we need, um, and budgetary constraints, everything, like fuel and everything. And once again, they have a critical tasker. And it is again in that same FX cell during the MDMP, when we're war gaming course of action, you have the S3 playing the blue four, you have the S2 playing the op four. What's the S4 loggy doing? He's the referee, he or she is the referee. And they turn to the op four and say, I'm sorry, your munitions don't shoot that far. And they turn to the uh, S3 blue four and they say, I'm sorry, at this point in time, all of your tanks have run out of fuel. So the S4 logistics officer is the referee for all MDMP course of action wargaming. All right, and that's a critical thing. Under the S4 shop, you find quite a few things. Again, not surprisingly, when you look at that logistics plan, uh, that is the supply section, the motor pool platoon. Yeah, that's right. Uh, do you have trucks? Do you have vehicles and, and Jeeps and things like that that need to drive this over to there? Well, guess what? That supply section has a motor pool platoon, drivers and vehicles attached to them. And then you'll also see uh, certain things like, typically you'll see your nuclear, biological, chemical warfare, your MBC section attached to the S4. So you'll see things like that. Um, S5 shop is your civil affairs. It is headed up by a public affairs officer, a PAO or NCO. The product is press release matrix. All the ways that they are going to interact with the news media, with local um, governance, and even coming right down to commercial um, agencies so that 
we can do our operations, move the civilians to the side where they're safe and they're kept informed enough so that our operations minimize the negative impact on the civilian population um, and their work is coordinated and synchronized enough that we can still achieve our effect. And so the PAO and uh, civil affairs have a very narrow scope of what they look at, um, but frankly it's, it's pretty damn critical. You do see things like human terrain systems sometimes attaching into your S5 when attached. That is research and study groups that are study the most efficient ways to deal with the civilian population and stuff like that. What you don't see is PSYOPs. Um, psychological operations, if that's going to have a section here at battalion or brigade, that would be attached up to uh, the S2 intel. This is civil affairs. It's different. They're, we're not doing um, psyops and information warfare here. This is really working with the civilians to keep them out of our way and us out of their way as much as possible. Um, S6 shop is your communication, communications officer and or NCO, their product is the comms plan. Yep, another matrix that says here's where all the communication assets are. And remember that it's not just, you know, FM radio anymore, guys. It's laptops and network systems and cyber warfare and cyber security. And so this is huge. It's a lot of equipment. It's a lot of technical special uh, specialties involved there. And so the S6 shop's principal duty then is running the tactical operations center for the commander and the entire staff. So the talk section, all those radio jockeys for lack of better, and pucksters for a lack of better words, that's the talk section and it usually falls in right there in the S6 shop. And then finally you have the S7 shop which is training, it's headed up by a curriculum officer and or NCO. The product is the training matrix typically for a whole year at a time. Sometimes, sometimes these training matrices are predicted 18 to 24 months out, um, so you have different phases going through. They work closely with personnel to say who's received what training for promotion and all this other stuff. But their big thing is that training matrix, which again is ginormous. And then also they have like um, a range liaison section because training, you need training space and training assets. So of course you're going to work with uh, supply and all this other stuff under S4 and S3 to Again, it's got to get on the, the plan or it's not part of the plan. All these, these different shops interact with each other and that is certainly true for the S7 um, training shop, but uh, they have a liaison section specifically to um, uh, coordinate and synchronize for range access to training. And you think of ranges as firing ranges and explosive ranges, but frankly, they're far more than that. I mean, just open trees and woods and a mountain range, you know, you're going, okay, well, that's maneuver space. We need to get, that's a range. And so is a lot of stuff that you're doing in schoolhouses, inside of classrooms with air conditioning and all this other stuff. Yep, that, again, that's a range in military parlance, that is. And so there you go. Um, the major portions of a battle staff are the command team with commanding officer, executive officer, command sergeant major, fire support officer, and chief of staff. Your S1 uh, personnel shop is headed up by the personnel officer and builds the tip fit. The S2 intel um, is headed by an intel officer for the IPB and threat assessment. The S3 shop is the operations officer and they produce the sync matrix uh, for every plan we ever dreamt of. The F S4 sh a logistics shop is a logistics officer and they have the logistics plan that they're responsible for. S5 shop is your civil affairs headed up by the PAO and they do your press release matrix. S6 shop communications officer NCO, comms plan, um, they run the talk. S7 shop training, it's your curriculum officer NCO, they run the training matrix and they have a liaison, a range liaison section. Um, boom, boom, boom. That is pretty much your battalion, regiment, S uh, battle staff. All of the others morph and change, but they're built on that basic premise. And so when we talk operational warfare, we say, well, how do you achieve your effects? How is it just a commander with that command team barking orders to his company commanders? And the answer is absolutely not. He has this entire team, this entire battle staff of specialists that are lined up and they have a protocol of how they brief the commander, you know, the bubs and the cubs, the commander update briefs and all of this stuff. And they have a, uh, you know, a chief of staff 
that synchronize and coordinates the whole entire thing. So it's fascinating to watch if you've never seen this. A talk itself seems like absolute chaos, but it's directioned. It's a chaos shoved into a direction. And watching cubs and bubs and a staff work together in effect cells, build an MDM or a plan through an MDMP that then is blessed off as an order. It's a fascinating thing to watch. It's something akin to a Swiss watch when it's done well. So, okay, that's what I wanted to talk to you today was the Napoleonic Battlestaff, and there it is.